Hello, dear listener, and welcome to the debut episode of the Nope Too Creepy podcast. I'm your host, Dan David, and whether you're coming from YouTube or you're a first-time listener, I'm so glad to have you here. I've been itching to get into the podcast game for some time now, and I figured October would be the best time to kick things off. Each episode of the Nope Too Creepy podcast will feature stories that, and this has been my goal from the start, become the reason you're afraid to use the bathroom at night. Well, that's the hope, at least. This week's episode will feature two stories of sinister crime and handy detective work. We'll kick things off with a story by an unknown author who, since posting this to No Sleep, has disappeared from the face of Reddit. After listening, you may start to worry and wonder if he's become the next victim of whatever is wreaking so much havoc in his city. I present to you, I didn't walk home tonight. I've got this friend, I'll call him Mike, to keep things simple. And he's one of those people that loves to talk. One of those guys who talks so much that you know half of what they say is just bullshit but he does it so easily that you feel what he's saying has to be true because one who comes up with this shit and two it rolls off his tongue so smooth that it couldn't be a lie plus he's kind of a putz and i know he couldn't pull this stuff out of his dome he's into some morbid shit and being at the pd he definitely gets his and my fill. Moms killing their kids, old ladies melted onto love seats, cats rooting around in some dead hobo's belly, you know, run of the mill messed up kind of shit. Anyway, the guy talks a lot. Now, I've gotten into this bad habit where I've started to record what he says without telling him. I know it's messed up, but people don't believe me when I share his stories and butcher them half the time. I hadn't seen him for a while, and whenever he and I didn't meet up, he always had enough stuff to fill a novel. He looked real stressed out when he walked into the bar and I waved him over to the table with my phone face down, but recording. He sat down with a thousand yard stare and it took a second for him to snap back into reality and start talking. I'm gonna put this into text as best as I can, so bear with me. Mike. We think we own the place, man. I mean, look around. Tables, lights, heating. Thank God it's colder than outside. I don't know, man. It just... It feels all manufactured, like we're pulling a blanket over our heads and everything is fine. Cause we're safe in here and everything is fine in our little bubble. Mike, what the hell are you talking about? Listen, I've been digging through some of the old case files again and I found one of them from 20 years ago and it's this bum, right? Standard deal. Death by exposure, no family claiming the body, no ID, just another John Doe on the streets. But man, the pictures of this guy ripped to fucking shreds. I'm talking guts ripped out, femur cracked open, and picked clean. This guy was destroyed. Now, in the report, They say it was probably rats and dogs and whatever else. And since the guy was a bum, not much more went into it than that. I mean, who's gonna cry foul about some nobody freezing on the street just cause it made a mess on some dirty alley? So, 
It's the graveyard shift, and I've got nothing better to do, and I head back and start rooting around other cases from around that same time, and eventually, I find another one. Same deal. Some bum. It's cold, and he's dead. But the scene was a f***ing horror show. This guy was ripped limb from limb, blood and guts strewn across the walls like he was tossed into a goddamn blender. The guy's arms and legs are picked clean, but again, dirty alley, rats, dogs, case closed. Let me get this straight, Mike. You mean to tell me that no one gave a shit about people being ripped apart in downtown? Bums, man. Not a whole lot of resources being funneled into the bum investigation squad. But yeah, I got curious, so next shift, I went into the records and parked myself there all night. And pretty much every night I could. It's been too cold for people to stir shit up, so I pretty much had as much time as I wanted. 22. 22 files that may as well have been copies of each other. Now, at this point, I'm feeling like some kind of CSI, and I'm about to crack the next big serial killer with my face on some book. I'm matching dates, districts, and come to find out that they'd been moving deeper into the city. And then they sort of just cluster up in the slums. And then... Nothing. Just nothing. Just when these things were all back to back, it stopped. All at once. And yeah, we were finding dead bums, but nothing like before. Wait, wait. So, you mean to tell me the guy got his fill and then just skipped town? I don't think it was a guy. These fellas were torn apart. No guy could do what was in these pictures, man. I mean, now and then, you see someone all hopped up on PCP, and they can do some wild shit. But not like this. In one of these last files I looked through, someone did their homework. Probably some rookie, or someone looking to make detective, but for some reason, this guy took some details down. And there was some footage. I couldn't grab the tape. God knows where that ended up. But the guy took a pretty good account and stuck it in the file along with a couple stills. Apparently, one of the old warehouses round there had a security camera aimed at the street. Real long shot. And it catches the guy coming into frame. The bum was staggering down the street, drunk out of his gourd, when he suddenly stops. He kind of swivels around for a second, and then just stands still. Out of nowhere, the f***er just books it. He didn't make it very far though, cause halfway down the block, they found what was left of him. At this point, Mike starts to root around in his coat for a second, and then pulls out a folded piece of paper. He took that paper and tossed it at the table towards me. Now, at the scene, it was a cluster f but more or less the same story. Bones and blood littered around, but here and there in the snow, it looked like there was a scuffle. Drag marks, scrapes along the snow, patches of blood. Whatever got him wasn't the damn cold. But like the others, exposure and filed away. Wait, wait, no one looked into any of this shit? 22 people get torn apart and no one bats an eye? <sighs> well, this went on for four months throughout multiple districts, and it happened to bums, remember? Not people, cause people got families, and families raise hell, or at least they file a missing persons report. 
and different branches don't really talk to each other as much as you'd think. Even in the winter, we're spread pretty thin, and if no one is chasing us on stuff like this, it's pretty simple to just file it away and move on to something that someone is angry about. It's a big city with a lot of people to police. And people want their city kept under control. I stopped the recording there. I took a cab home, even though the bar is only a couple blocks from my place. The picture that Mike showed me was a copy of an already pretty grainy image. In it, you could see the guy facing down a long street that the lamppost barely made visible. At the end of the light, you could make out shapes. Not really shapes, just impressions, outlines in the dark and countless pairs of glowing pinpricks reflecting back at the camera. Our next story follows a detective who may just be facing the biggest crime of their career. A crime that has to be solved, or it may just cost them their life. But at the hands of who? From Reddit user, Anoinia Prime. Here's a story titled, We Found My Body, and I'm about to investigate my murder. The team received a call around 9 p.m. last Friday. A group of construction workers were repairing an elevator shaft in an unsealed warehouse when they noticed the bloodstains and pungent stench. Then, a rotting arm dropped onto someone's head. They immediately dialed the emergency number, and we arrived 25 minutes later. The corpse was in the second stage of decay, and moving the elevator had partially dismembered it. It took the forensic team over four hours to scrape and extract every tidbit of the corpse. In the meantime, I, as the lead investigator, directed my team to brush for fingerprints, conduct interviews, and snap photographs. Typical investigation prep work. Perfunctorily, I deducted that the body belonged to an upper-middle-class, white-collar worker, male, Caucasian, in his mid-thirties. Casually, I crouched down and examined what was left of his neck and head. A blunt weapon had crushed the skull in, but I could confidently say that the actual cause of death was strangulation. Although the corpse's clothes had been shredded by the machinery, I recognized the trademark fabric from a luxury brand I frequently wore. I had distant memories of owning a similar shirt and tie, but my migraine made it difficult for me to remember anything with precision. We recorded witness statements and went home for the weekend after that. The next Monday, my supervisor, Patrick, called me into his office. Forensics had easily ID'd the corpse and found fingerprints on a blood-stained sledgehammer laying nearby. There was a horrible pounding sensation on my skull, and I was sipping my third coffee, but I immediately reported in. Looking me straight in the eyes, Patrick said, this case is batshit. Feeling more alert, I peered at him from over the rim of my coffee mug. Patrick had a habit of classifying cases from boring to batshit. So far, the only case that ever earned the batshit rating was when 20-something infants were birthed and eaten by a pair of sisters and their father. This was my first time experiencing a 
batshit case. Ugh, looks like a regular smash and dash to me, I offered. Though I hadn't reviewed the forensic report yet, I could imagine what happened. The perpetrator began by hitting the victim on the head from behind. The victim fell but wasn't dead, so the perpetrator strangled him with his tie. Afterwards, the perpetrator tugged the body up the stairs and threw the corpse down the elevator shaft. Based on what I knew so far, I would point fingers at one of the construction workers. The perp, likely male, was strong enough to move the corpse of a healthy man and familiar enough with the layout to know how to access the elevator shaft. The victim scratched the perpetrator while he was under attack, so we have DNA of both the victim and the perpetrator. Patrick cleared his throat. His micro-expressions told me that he felt extremely uncomfortable and was holding back important information pertaining to the case. <clears throat> uh, we, uh, we were easily able to find an exact match to the DNA of both the victim and the murderer. Huh, <laughs> great. I hadn't contributed enough to claim any credit on this case, which meant I was still one case behind my rival. But hey, it also meant one less crime to deal with. My migraine from last Wednesday was distracting enough as it is. I turned back to Patrick. In that case, do you want to discuss the Pomestic Lock Room murder? I interviewed the sister-in-law and her testimonies aren't matching up. The perp's DNA matches your profile. Patrick's words tumbled into each other and then he blurted out, we found your fingerprints on the weapon and found your skin underneath the victim's fingernails. Excuse me? My coffee mug met the table with a loud clang and brown liquid sloshed out. This wouldn't be the first time a criminal tried to frame an investigator for a murder, but it was the first time it happened to me. So, who have I supposedly killed? Well, that's the batshit part, said Patrick. The victim's DNA is also a perfect match with your profile. You know the feeling when someone says something so damn incredulous that you have nothing to say in response? You just kind of open and close your mouth a few times, wishing that you had a witty comeback. It's speechlessness mixed with disbelief and irritation. Irritation because, come on boss, it's Monday and not April Fool's Day, so stop pulling my leg. I'm dead serious. With a grunt, Patrick handed me a folder. Forensic results and investigation notes. Well, maybe not dead, but I am serious. Facial reconstruction revealed my face. DNA was an exact match. Even identical twins couldn't achieve this level of exact DNA match. The shirt, reconstructed by technology, was the same one I wore to work last Wednesday, which was also the approximated day of death. Clasping his fingers in front of his face, Patrick went on to say, Since you're the best investigator we have, you can help on the case. <sighs> so, let me get this straight. You're telling me I murdered myself, threw myself down an elevator shaft, left a ludicrous amount of evidence, and now I'm going to head the investigation on my own murder. I couldn't keep the sarcasm out of my voice. Obviously, someone, somewhere, royally screwed up something. Probably forensics. Typically, they were a reliable bunch, but they occasionally arrived at bizarre conclusions. They once ID'd the corpse of a gorilla as the still-living former president of the United States, after all. 
We are waiting for the test results of a second examination. What I respect about Patrick is that the man can always keep his calm. Professional equanimity. But I would like to include you in this investigation, yes. A part of me is confident that a second examination would yield more reasonable results. But the part of my brain that usually knew better was trying to tell me something different. I stared at the pictures, looking into the lifeless eyes peeking out from between folds of bloated flesh. My head spun. <sighs> well, if I were to conduct this investigation, I suppose I could start with the scratches on my forearm. The angles of the marks made sense if someone scratched me while I tried to strangle them from behind. Moreover, I had some friction burns on the palm of my hand. The world is truly a strange place at times. Thank you for joining me on the maiden voyage of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed yourself. If you did, you can always hear more on YouTube at youtube.com slash nope too creepy. You can also connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under nope too creepy. Thank you to the authors of these awesome stories. Be sure to subscribe so you can join me on future episodes. Due to being new to this format, I think the best course of action will be to go slow and steady for now. That means one episode every two weeks. Once I get the hang of things, that will probably change, but for now, we'll just stick to two podcasts a month. So until next time, stay safe out there. This is your host, Dan David, and I'll be seeing you in the next episode.